Yeah. Welcome officially, everyone, to the June NGO uh, Researchers Forum. My name is Ben McAlpine. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy here at NCOS. I'll start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today. For me, it is the Gadigal people. I want to pay my respect to their elders past and present. And it's always worth recognising that we do that acknowledgement um, in the lead up to a referendum on uh, the voice and recognising how for many Aboriginal people and communities that is going to be an incredibly difficult time uh, as they need to listen to uh, the rest of the country debating uh, their rights from a constitution. So want to recognise that and welcome you all today. Also worth recognising that uh, we are in Refugee Week. Uh, the theme is there on the page around finding freedom, which encourages us to explore what freedom means for the millions of refugees who are embarking on dangerous journeys every day. And uh, particularly in the media, there have been some incredibly sad stories coming out of Europe over the last, it seems, uh, relevant to be making sure that we celebrate the really positive contributions of refugees, but also recognising um, the, the dangers and difficulties and the impact that that has on us as a community and as a country. That's, that's me, that's my face. I've forgotten that that picture was there. Um, so I look, I look awfully happy. Uh, so brief intro for those who are new to the researchers forum. Uh, so this was started way back in 2008 by Mission Australia and the Benevolent Society. It's obviously evolved over that time, uh, but it's all about trying to create a space for NGO researchers and sector partners to come together, present and discuss uh, your incredibly valuable work and strengthen the evidence-informed approaches being used in the sector. Uh, it was relaunched in March 2022, and we uh, all come together agreeing what the forum uh, needs to achieve and what it looks like. Uh, and we're really focusing on that uh, great research, uh, good practice examples, and trying to aim for building of capability. So in that vein, we have three really, or two very exciting and one hopefully somewhat exciting uh, speakers uh, today, uh, because I thought it'd be a bit weird to say that I am going to be a very exciting speaker because I'm third. Uh, thanks to all of the speakers who have dedicated their time today to speak. Um, so first of all, we have uh, Nicole Harvey and Kate Davies uh, talking about Together Home uh, from a practitioner's perspective on how well that program has worked. Uh, we also then have Dr. Grenville Rose and Samati Govindasamy. I really apologise if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, on Community Research Advisory Committee around co-design and how we can ensure that it is a meaningful process. And then thirdly is me. Uh, NCOS has recently released some, uh, what we think is very exciting research in conjunction with the National Center for Social and Economic Modeling at the University of Canberra. Uh, I don't want, I'm not gonna go into the depths of the findings. I really wanna show the tools that we've launched to try to show how we are trying to make the data that came out of the research as accessible as possible. A reminder, friendly reminder to our speakers, uh, we've got 15 minutes for each speaker, so if we can do our best to try to uh, keep to that time, that'd be great. If people have questions, uh, please put them into the chat box. We'll have a discussion time at the end rather than trying to do it uh, along the way. Um, and I really hope that people at the end will have some time to share information. So if you've got uh, interesting things happening out there or observations, that is the time to be sharing across the sector. So it has come to that point where I will hand over to our first set of speakers, Nicole Harvey and Dr. Kate Davies. Over to you. Hello, can I share some slides, Ben? Yes, I believe you can and strongly encourage. Great. Nicole, do you want to say g'day while I get the slides up? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kate. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, Nicole Harvey, uh, Manager uh, Support Coordination and Community Partnerships with Pacific Link Housing. And before I start, I too would like to acknowledge that where I am seated at the moment is on Dark Young Country. 
and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thanks, Kate. Hi, and I'm Kate from Uni of Newcastle, coming to you from beautiful Awabakal land um, and have had the privilege of working with Nicole and the Pacific Link team over the last year and a half on this program. Um, Nicole's going to tell you a little bit about the Together Home program and the model that Pacific Link used. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the research that we did and we'll talk through some findings and some recommendations that came out of that. Um, do you want to tell everyone a bit about Together Home and Pacific Link, Nicole? Sure, okay, thank you. Um, the Together Home program commenced in uh, at, the, at the end of June 2020. Um, right in the, the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic and as a direct response to the pandemic, responding to those who were sleeping rough and accessing temporary accommodation during that time. Um, the funding was COVID stimulus funding. Um, and of course, considering the nature of not only the pandemic, but the need um, for people who are uh, street sleeping, it was a very rapid implementation of the program community housing providers across um, all of the districts of New South Wales uh, received um, the funding and governance for this program. The models, um, if you like, the model of operating was left somewhat to, to the CHPs, the community housing providers to, to come up with. Our model was a little bit unique. Uh, we created a support coordination model. Um, Kate will show a slide where that is a very good diagram of what that looks like, basically. The support coordination team sat with Pacific Link Housing with myself as program manager. And I really do need to acknowledge the work of the coordinator of the program, Tracy Nastanza, um, at Pacific Link. Uh, and we contracted uh, on a fee for service arrangement um, uh, three, uh, initially three support providers uh, with the second tranche that um, came out in the following 12 months. We brought in a fourth um, support partner and we uh, developed um, service agreements, contracts um, for the hours of support to be provided per participant, which was very negotiable and participant led. And I think that's a very important part of our uh, operation and the support coordination model is participant led, client centered with our participants voice um, first and foremost um, in the program. Um, and it is uh, for the first tranche, and for the subsequent tranches, um, it was a two-year uh, support provision, so intensive wraparound support following the Housing First principles. Um, and with the support and the tenancy component very delineated, uh, but with our support coordination team sitting, sitting across those two components. So if you like, the support coordination team became like a conduit, a bit of a buffer, a bit of a filter, and a conduit, um, uh, particularly to ensure our participants were very aware of what was happening, responsibilities with tenancy, and being very flexible around the support arrangement to ensure we were meeting the need. Great. Uh, so this was a really wonderful example, I think, of a um, of a practitioner-led research project. So the team at Pacific Link were doing this work and realised that something special was going on in their practice and um, came to us at University of Newcastle to see if we could work with them to kind of capture some of this kind of magic that was going on in these relationships and recognising that the Together Home program that came out in the midst of COVID um, was unusual in the level of resourcing and that uh, amidst this awful time, there was an opportunity for really incredible lessons. So that's where that partnership came into play. Um, the, the perspectives that we looked at in this research project were those of the practitioners. And when we say practitioners, we mean all of those workers who had some kind of function in delivering aspects of the program. Um, but we certainly um, acknowledge the in important perspectives of the people who were living the experiences of homelessness and finding their way into tenancies. And we hope that there's some opportunities for future work directly with those lived experience voices. Uh, we conducted a series of interviews, 
or for those who were more comfortable speaking in a group. We talked with groups of practitioners together and they were from nine different organisations, so government and non-government, um, that included those organisations that had formal service agreements with Pacific Link, but there are a whole bunch of other partners um, who were involved in the program as referrers or who were sharing support functions with those people. Hey, Kate, I'm oh. sorry to interrupt, but the um, maybe you're looking at the kind of slideshow, people are looking at the kind of slides that sit behind that. So if you're flicking oh. to yeah. classic scenario, Oh, I just wanted to let you know before we got too deep. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. Um, I'm glad I set the scene with my microphone issues so that. Oh, look, you go. know, perfect. I, I think thank we've you. all gotten very, very kind and sympathetic about tech fails, haven't we? I well, certainly. Particularly I've, when it's being recorded. Yeah, I, I, I've gotten over my embarrassment of tech fails these days as well. It's just part of life, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so, and I hope I didn't have anything incriminating written in the notes. I don't think I did. Um, the, no, 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 you look safe, don't worry. <laughs> so it was a qualitative project. We did that series of interviews and, and group chats. Um, and then we had a workshop with some of those stakeholders towards the end of the project to talk about the findings and verify them and test them out. Um, and we got some really powerful stories from those practitioners. So. Some of the some of the things that we learned about and that practitioners talked about were what it what it meant for the people that they were supporting. So generally the people who took part in the Together Home program were described as participants, so Together Home participants. Um, and you know, even though there's a whole bunch of data being collected, rightly so, around some of the quantitative indicators like housing and employment. There was all this other really nuanced personal stuff going on for people um, that was equally, uh, if not more important than, than some of that kind of um, frontline data that we might see. Um, the idea of housing was not just about a house, but about a home and the sense of safety and security that came with that. Um, one of the experiences that practitioners talked about a lot was the access to health services for participants. So people who had often uh, been re-traumatised by the health system and had built up substantial distrust of the system over the years, actually through that intensive support, the security of housing, um, building the relationships with caseworkers had been able to access hospitals and health workers, and often they um, had some serious complex health issues identified um, and treated. Um, and we'll we'll talk talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and getting getting work, it wasn't it wasn't so much about employment necessarily, but about people's employability or taking initial steps towards looking for work or just feeling the confidence that um, that people might see work or volunteering or being part of the community as as an aspiration. Um, reconnections and relationships were really important. That with that support um, the housing and the casework support people were able to reconnect with family um, feeling safe and secure in the home um, and and there were some some really powerful stories that practitioners shared around that um, for example a participant who um, some might have described the person as having hoarding behaviours. Um, the practitioner described it as collecting and that finally this person felt safe in the space of their home to be able to collect things and create an environment that felt safe for them. Um, in one case, there was even um, a discussion about a participant whose drug use had increased in, this, in their home, but that was because they felt safe to do so. And that was part of an ongoing process of getting well and recovering um, that really beautifully exemplifies actually the housing first model and going on a journey with someone. Um, there were a number of participants who actually um, died during their time with the Together Home program. Um, and it was really interesting the ways that practitioners talked about that as something that was strong and powerful in their relationships uh, because those participants 
um, who passed away during their time with Together Home were uh, often those people who hadn't had access to health services before, who were living with um, pretty serious health conditions, often undiagnosed, but because of their connections to Together Home and their trust with those workers, they were able to die with dignity, they were able to access pain relief, um, and they were even able with the support of Together Home brokerage funds, um, able to have a nice funeral and have connections with family to come to that space. So um, we thought those stories were just so powerful. Um, in terms of what the practitioners did, and they just talked really in an open way to us about what they thought was important in terms of practice, um, a lot of it was about the time to build relationships. So the Together Home program um, gave workers a couple of years to, to spend time with people. There was an individualised amount of hours allocated. So practitioners saw a difference in this program to some of the other casework models, for example, that they'd worked in where, you know, they really didn't get that time to build rapport and relationship and work through issues like trust, for example, um, and sitting with that dignity of risk, like getting to know people and being okay with people's um, decisions and where they were at was really important. Um, the... The wraparound support model was seen as really important. A number of the practitioners said, you know, we, we know that housing first is a model that works. We know that wraparound support is important. It's language that gets talked about a lot in the sector, but we don't actually ever really have an opportunity to do that in, in an authentic way. And this program was for many of them this kind of really great opportunity to do what they knew to be good practice. Um, and the trust building was such an important part of their work that came up again and again um, because the, the participants in Together Home were people who had um, had were living often with significant trauma and had had really terrible experiences of institutions and the health and human services um, system. Uh, Nicole, do you want to talk about some of these connections to, um, to other services and systems? Do you want to take over for a bit? Sure. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, the, one of the key domains for Together Home uh, outcome domains was um, health and wellbeing. And of course, we can only imagine uh, for people that have um, spent sometimes uh, upwards of 15 to 20 years uh, street sleeping, have extremely compromised health, uh, premature ageing, um, and have not received the diagnosis or the care um, that they need. So when coming into the program, creating those connections, of course, were important. But as Kate mentioned before the time that it took to build the trust and rapport, um, uh, you know, uh, was, was we had to balance, we had to balance the time. Um, and of course, we, we developed the learning around building trust and rapport is also a time around healing. What we can say was that we developed connections with health providers um, around the Central Coast who, um, if you like, continue to agree to see participants who either cancelled quite regularly for fear or lack of trust, um, or who didn't quite engage with the appointments. I think another really important thing, and I'm mindful of time, um, but the other important thing is having the support provider there through that journey, that health journey, when many participants knew that the prognosis would not be good. And also to explain what was what was being said in, in the appointments, what, what was the, the outcome and, and what, was, what was happening for them. I think that was a really important and key aspect of the program. Um, of course, we know, everyone knows the, the, the very, very stressful, difficult um, time that we have in the housing space. I think for us to, to uh, house participants uh, from referral um, uh, to housing under, in, in, within six weeks, uh, for approximately 80% of our participants for that to happen, I think is an outstanding um, demonstration of, of what Pacific Link could do in this space. Um, and each of our participants very quickly uh, were given a long-term housing plan with some sustaining their housing in the private rental market, um, hopefully into the long term and moving into our general uh, portfolio um, as a CHP. 
The collaboration has been enormous within the space. I've worked in the SHS space for some time before coming to a CHP. I think the collaboration within this space has been enormous and the flow on effect has been, we've been able to create a program with Central Coast Local Health District, delivering a program for inpatients of mental health based on a very similar model to Together Home. Those sorts of outcomes we're particularly proud of and those, those relationships we have will last for the long term. Yeah, there's some real, real ripple effects, I think, um, will really have long-term impacts on the sector. Um, the Some of the key lessons, and I'm mindful that we're, we're at time, but um, that, that the actual structure of the program did enable practitioners to do that long-term um, re relational practice with participants and get to understand people, but also the nature of the funding structure and having some flexibility of funding was really important. Um, and that the collaboration and linkages and shifting away from those models of operating in silos was really important. And you know, ten tenancy providers and community housing providers walking alongside mental health services, for example, was incredibly powerful. Um, and, and for us, from the perspective of researchers, it's just been an absolute a, a joy and a privilege to, to um, spend time with the team at Pacific Link and, and all of those amazing practitioners. So we're very grateful. Over to you, Ben. Perfectly timed that. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a number of questions, but because we have a discussion time later, I'm going to hold off, but I'm sure other people have questions that as well. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing. Uh, next, we are moving on to our second set of speakers from Flourish Australia. Uh, Flourish represents one of the most specialised mental health supports available in the country with the largest peer workforce. They were formerly known as Richmond uh, PRA, and they've been serving communities for over 60 years. And together, they're going to talk to us about the fresh learnings from uh, the process that the organisation has in place to ensure that the voices of lived experience are meaningfully and effectively captured in their work. So thank you so much to Grenville and Samati. I don't know who I'm handing over to first, but I assume one of you will jump in and tell me. <laughs> ah, yes, that would be me. I think as I think as as we've arranged it, um, I'm I'm going to handle the presentation part, and Samati will fill the questions later. If that's still uh, is that still working? Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Brendan Rose. Um, I re actually recently left Flourish. This is all organised before while I was still at Flourish, and um, uh, now I'm be joining the Acacia Lived Experience Unit at um, ANU shortly. And uh, yeah, I identify as someone with lived experience of mental health and uh, drug use issues, including injecting drug use. Um, for better or worse, as I put it. Um, this is what 40 years of recovery looks like. Uh, and lived experience is a very, very broad term. Um, and so that's part of why I introduce myself and say what my experience is. I was, uh, I was hospitalized, but it was a private system. I always saw private psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, I used to say I never saw a psychologist I didn't feel sorry for. So, you know, I, I wouldn't call that a success. My, my recovery came from elsewhere. Uh, one other thing, we've got Simon's um, photo on the, um, the screen there. Um, he did tell me that uh, one of the people in, in this uh, photo was on the committee I'm about to talk about, and he said uh, he was no longer being used as the face of flourish lived experience, and he was um, he was not missing at that time. I, I used to be involved with uh, hepatitis New South Wales very heavily, and I was the face of hepatitis C in um, in Australia. Basically, I was, even went to Perth and saw myself on a billboard. And I'm not missing that degree of notoriety. Occasionally, people coming up in the street and saying, "Hi, I've seen you somewhere." Anyhow, um, I started getting involved in the lived experience um, area in 2002. I wanted to do something more meaningful. And uh, the Hepatitis New South Wales did four days of training, which made me more aware of the issues around social inclusion for marginalised groups and being able to speak up. And being involved with Hepatitis New South Wales, I thought was really good because, um, um, well, being on the board and all the other things I did with them, um, got exposed to um, like um, issues around HIV, injecting drug use, Hep C, Hep B, um, LGBTIQ plus community. So it was a really good um, intro to marginalised communities because look at me, you know, I'm a middle class 
Anglo, straight Aussie guy. So uh, my, my appreciation marginalization was not great prior to 20 or so years ago. And, and the implications of it too, um, as opposed to just being able to feel it and know it. Um, the genesis for this committee, I'm, I'm trying to explain the background because I, I think the philosophy is really important here because each setting has its own individual challenges and opportunities. And so uh, in a way, I think the philosophy is the most important part. Damn it, I forgot to start my timer. So I will try and keep the time. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm going to the philosophy of it. And, and I think that's the, really is the crucial bit. To me, research and service delivery for that matter must include the people that the research or the service delivery affects. Otherwise, you're going to miss things. Uh, perhaps particularly in research because uh, as a focus, because it's very hard, or it has in the past been very hard to get people involved uh, in the research process, because if people see research as being mystical, and only people with PhDs can do it and all that, notwithstanding also my education. So um, I was involved, there was a committee at a place I used to work, and they were not taken very seriously, let's say. We tried to have input to the board. I think we had a lot of success. Oh, well, initially, in fact, um, there were students running it and they were doing a very variable job. So I sort of got involved. And then we tried to push it up into board level and that didn't really go anywhere and people felt quite dismissed. So uh, while we have collectively had a good time together and discussed important things and then changed the research, they, they made additions to the research I did there that were very useful. We didn't have much success in changing the organisation. So come to Flourish, um, I was starting to set up the same thing and I sent out... Um, invitations through the staff uh, and that didn't really go anywhere but then I contacted the um, community advisory council that Flourish has and a few people uh, became interested in the, in being involved and those same people are, are still involved um, although one of them I did meet at a Flourish occasion we went out for dinner and I was sitting next to him um, over a beer and a meal and um, he made a terrific uh, just what he was saying the really articulate nature and his passion for research and for um, help assisting people with lived experience made him, uh, I just invited him to be on and asked everyone else if um, he wanted to be on. And so those three people are still there now. Uh, and th that's the important part too for me. It's the consensus nature, which takes longer um, than, you know, someone running it and really trying to um, uh, direct the way things are going to, to a schedule. And I understand the benefit of frameworks and schedules, but there's also leaving that and leaving time for consensus. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a little while. Panel selection is important and it's a really big issue. Um, if you talk about people have to be able to contribute. Now you can foster that by again, the consensus approach by power sharing, by really trying to get, be at all at one level and valuing the expertise that people with experience do bring. Um, because as I explained it, so for example, I used to work in, um, community pharmacy research, uh, but I was brought in, I know nothing about pharmacy, but I was brought in as the statistics expert. So I'd sit around a table and that was my contribution. And the same thing with lived experience, people uh, can have that knowledge and vision to contribute. Flippantly, I, I gave a presentation a few years back at the University of New South Wales, and it was about lived experience in mental health. And I, I sort of entitled it flippantly, and I did check this with people first, we see things you don't. And I think that's the core reason to include people with lived experience in, research, in the research process. It's come to me time and time again when I've been in these meetings with people that they pick up on things that I missed, that I didn't see. And partly that's because I don't have that lived experience. My experience is very different to the people on that, on that committee. I'll give you an example from research in the past. Um, there's a guy called Bradley Foxlewin who's around. And he did research on seclusion and restraint. Now, he wanted to do that research because he experienced himself seclusion and restraint. And it motivated him to do the research. And what he found, um, and the way he conducted it was get everyone in the room and again, have the patients, doctors and uh, nurses all in one place talking to each other, coming to a consensus. He found one that no one really um, liked doing it or no one liked receiving it. So no one in the room was having fun with seclusion and restraint. 
And two, while the patients and uh, while the um, nurses and doctors saw it as uh, a treatment, that's how it was defined, uh, the patients saw it as a failure of treatment, which is a very different perspective. So when I say we see things you don't, doctors and nurses, I think, were ticking off their KPIs. This is my interpretation. And they didn't see seclusion and restraint amongst that, just get your KPIs done, you've delivered a treatment. But what the people receiving the service saw, and this is just an example, but I think you know, I think it's a fairly cogent one. What the people receiving the service saw was a failure of treatment, and that's how it became redefined. And that changed then. If you look at seclusion and restraint figures around Australia, in fact, but particularly at Canberra Hospital around that time, they they dropped dramatically, and they're dropping around Australia. There's one of the good news is pieces in mental health seclusion and restraint. Last time I looked, is dropping. Um. Initially, it was quite informal, uh, and that was appreciated. I think that gave people a chance to speak. But it is becoming more formalised, and as partly as a result, and um, uh, partly because of the private prior usefulness, uh, it's been, I think it's having more input into um, Flourish um, uh, research at this point in time, and uh, I think services in the future. Now, um, as I said, the ability to take part is important. I'm reading off notes here. Maybe I should have done a presentation, but uh, there are take part is important. That's a big area. So what makes people have relevant experience? What makes people able to take part is just a huge issue we don't have time for today. There are resources out there. The Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network has um, a co-design uh, pamphlet up there. There's Indigo Day's ladder. There's I looked around before, there's industry-specific resources if you're working in a different sector. There'll be resources there to um, to help you do this. But the main thing again is power sharing and being enabling people to be able to articulate uh, and feel free to contribute, which um, I think the the committee at Flourish has done. And I've been another organisation that also did it successfully. So there's out there. There's also I've had negative experiences where I've been in a room and really feel you know the lived experience people haven't felt listened to, even though the, the organisation was trying. I know that. Uh, but, um, yeah, they just weren't able to listen uh, straight. It was strange to see the, they had uh, academics and uh, service providers in the, in the forum that I was in. And the other person with lived experience at the table I was at uh, was a young woman, young Indigenous woman from outside Broome somewhere, about as demographically different as, from me as you can get. And we both got it. We understood each other. But the service providers and the um, the academics weren't quite getting it. You'd see them pause and go, nah, and ignore us. It was, it was a dramatic experience for me. So that power sharing and an engendering of a feeling of group of equals is really important. Consensus, uh, yep, okay, due to the uh, usefulness of the committee uh, and, and the increased demands for external research at Flourish, um, the committee's being going to be expanded. I'm not sure how it's progressing. Simity will know more if you have questions. And, um, and also more formalized, so more regular meetings. So I, I had the meetings, I um, had the meetings when there was a need. Thanks, Ben. Three minutes. I can time it now. Good. Um, I had the committee like when there was a research on, and um, people were able to contribute meaningfully to the um, um to the research that I've been doing. Uh, and in fact, in my, in altering, altering questionnaires, altering the interpretation of results, that sort of thing. And also we have been reviewing uh, external requests coming in and that's again, been very useful because again, they have different experience and see things that we're not seeing in, um, or even the ethics committees aren't seeing ethical points that are being missed by ethics committees because they're not based in the same ethical framework as someone has actually experienced the service. Um, so I'm here proselytizing for lived experience input because I think it's really crucial. Um, we are getting there, but, and I'm not talking about Flourish directly here, but we're getting there, but there's a way to go. And I think Flourish is heading there. They have the advantage of the, um, the Community Advisory Committee. They're a wonderful pool to draw from. I was speaking actually someone from Sydney Uni the other day who was working with them. And uh, they said they found the, um, the willingness to contribute and um, their ability to contribute and the way of consensus and the respectful way that that committee worked uh, was really good. And they've, they've had to change their research. So they're, they're, 
they went in to a two-day workshop with a bunch of ideas and they came up with a bunch of different ideas and they're having to do some major restructuring, uh, which is beautiful. That's that's why you need this sort of input as the research. So it's, they're using the research at the early stage, uh, using lived experience at every stage, actually, from the from the start, go to woe, as it were. And, um, and now they've just had to restructure the research based on that input. Um, yeah, I don't think we've really reached co-production um, or even perhaps co-design, but there's definitely been, I, I believe, meaningful input. I think the the fact that the same people are on there, that um, before I left, we had uh, some nice discussions together about, about how, how it's been to be on the committee. And I know they've changed um, as a result of hearing, the, hearing their voices. We've changed surveys and we've changed, um, we've changed the output and the way we analyze and report things. Um, yeah, so I see I'm running out of time. So I will close there and try and keep to time. I'm sorry, I have a meeting um, right after this, a bit of an emergency thing that came up. And uh, so I won't be around for much of question time. Thank you for your time and coming today though. Thank you so much for your time uh, in presenting and understand that you might need to drop off whenever you need to, and we will make sure that we uh, give some space for, for questions later on. Next in our uh, speakers is me. So what I'm going to do is I'll share my screen. I'll show you. the right time there we go so what i want to be doing is so this was research that was um only very recently uh released so uh it was in the in May. so i'll give a, a, a brief overview of what the research was but like i said what i really want to be doing is showing you the tools that have made the data available for people to be able to use and really hopefully drive change as a result of the research. So this was the mapping economic disadvantage in New South Wales. It was, as I said, uh, commissioned by NCOS uh, in collaboration with NATSIM at the University of Canberra. What NATSIM did is they took the 2021 census data uh, and some of the survey of income and housing and it used that data to uh, create or calculate and then create mapping of poverty rates for demographics across the state. And those demographics are by age, sex, employment, family arrangements. Uh, so that, you know, is that a, a couple only, a couple with dependent children, a lone household, et cetera. And then housing tenure. So that might be, uh, are you in the private rental market or do you own a home with a mortgage? And what was really exciting is that it allowed us to compare the results 2016 because this was the second time we've done the research. The research had four elements to it. Uh, the first on the left of the screen was the detailed report from Natsum. That uh, next one was the summary of key themes. And that was what we called the Great Divide, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then two tools. First was an online mapping tool, which we had previously released uh, in 2019 as well, and then a new tool, which was a dashboard that allowed users to look at all of the data available for a particular SA2. And I'll come to that in a second. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes giving you the key themes or a snapshot of the key themes, but not the purpose of the presentation, but I thought it'd be useful to give you a couple of uh, key themes. First one was that the research showed that New South Wales now has almost 1 million people living. So what that uh, equated to is while, interestingly, while the overall rate of poverty did not change significantly, uh, due to population growth, that still meant that 100,000 people fell below the poverty line. So it suggests that despite the ongoing and increasing understanding of poverty, what we're doing is clearly not working. And importantly, because this was 2021 data, since then we've had 
uh, I think is now 13 interest rate rises. I should know that off the top of my head. Uh, huge increases in uh, rent and then a massive inflation. So we would expect this situation to be far worse than it was in 2021. Particularly, there was a big shift in Greater Sydney. So while the overall rate of poverty didn't change substantially, that hid the, the real reality of what is a, a poverty divide within Sydney and a growing poverty divide. So if you live in southwestern or western Sydney, big increase in poverty rates, whereas to the east, the generally more affluent areas, a decrease in poverty rate. So we're seeing uh, a greater concentration of poverty in the western and southwestern parts of Sydney. One of the cohorts that saw the greatest growth in poverty rates were people over the age of 65. So of the 100,000 uh, additional people in poverty, 50,000, so half of that number, were over the age of 65. And that was particularly prevalent for uh, older women who are in private rental market. They saw a big spike from something like 25% to 57%, a huge increase in the poverty rate for that group. Uh, public housing, uh, on average, 60% of people who live in public housing live in poverty. Now, to me, that suggests that something's fundamentally broken in the system if we've got people living in public housing who are living uh, in poverty and thus affecting their ability to have a life of dignity. And then finally, Poverty rates for private renters, particularly in Greater Sydney, uh, saw a significant intensification increase by 10%, taking us to one in five uh, private renters in Greater Sydney living below the poverty line. And again, that was before serious issues in the rental market over the last 12, 18 months. So what I want to do is jump to the tools because that is the core thing that I really want to be able to share with you. If I bring up, this is the first tool. Can I get a wave, maybe, Rosalina, can you see this thing? Great. So this is a map or a mapping tool. It explains how to use it. This is all available on our website. Uh, we can send around the link. Uh, but what it shows you is there are two sets of tools. One is uh, the map now. So what is the estimate of 2021? It also shows you the map of how it has changed. And you can pick and choose all of these different categories. So you might be interested in the poverty rate for unemployed people, or it could be single people. And so what I'll do is I'll click up here and it takes us to the link where we can see the rate. So what this does is I can show you the rate of poverty for overall Greater Sydney. So I can zoom out and I can see all of New South Wales. I can, so this is the overall rate of poverty. I can then zoom in to anywhere I like. Let's for argument's sake, zoom into Sydney. And you can see very clearly that story that I was telling you before, where you can see real depths of poverty in Southwest and Western Sydney and far lower rates uh, in other parts. Shows you the, uh, the, the legend there. And then I can even zoom in further and I can pick a particular area let's just go with this one and that's Cabramatta Lansvale it shows that 25 percent of people in that area are living below the poverty line I can then change that and pick any of those other areas maybe for argument's sake I will pick single parent households one of the higher rates that we have in the state you can see almost no escaping poverty uh, across New South Wales if you have, are a single parent. And same thing, if I zoom into Sydney, you can see immense, immense depths of poverty for single parent households. I can then do the same for estimated change. I can pick the overall change rate and it shows me how has this changed overall. Again, you can zoom out You can, and it shows you that there was real deepening of poverty kind of the Riverina Murray area and some pockets kind of in the mid north coast. Whereas we zoom into Sydney to tell that story again, you can see that where the depth of poverty or the increase of poverty, the worsening of poverty was again, southwestern Sydney, a little bit in the western and an improvement to eastern and kind of northeastern greater Sydney. And again, I can pick any 
of these. Why don't we do for argument's sake? I know what I want to see. Private renters, particularly in Greater Sydney, you can see again, real deepening of poverty for people in Southwestern Sydney. So that's the first tool. The other tool is a dashboard. This is a new tool that we developed uh, this year. Uh, so while the map allows you to look at any individual uh, demographic uh, at any point as a, a geographic lens, this allows you to pick any SA2 across Greater Sydney and see all of the stats uh, that are presented in the data. So what I'll show you, I've got there's age, the composition, employment status, ownership, and then by sex. And you can then, what I'll do is I'll zoom in to show you this a bit more clearly. So I've picked uh, Bosley Park. That just happens to be the one that I, I picked. First of all, it shows you what is the rate in 2021? How has that changed since 2016? So this shows that it has increased by 80%. And then how does it compare to the region average? There are two averages. One was for Greater Sydney, one was the rest of New South Wales. And this particular area is 40% worse than the Greater Sydney average. It then breaks that same thing down for each of the poverty rate areas. So uh, children, young people, adults, older people. And this shows me, first of all, the, the Bossy Park SA2, the rate for kids under the age of 15, it's 29.2, so almost 30% of kids live in poverty. That's compared to the Greater Sydney average of 16%. That's showing us that it's 78% higher than Greater Sydney. It also shows you how that's changed in 2016. And it's then also colour coded. So what this immediately does is it focuses my attention on how much higher it is for kids. But also I might go, well, actually, while it's obviously not uh, as significantly different as kids. I can see how the rate for young people has really improved and that's gone against the trend in Greater Sydney. So increased by 31% in this area, but dropped by 8% in Greater Sydney. And it might, as a local service provider, might go, okay, we really don't do a lot with uh, younger people. Let's see what we might need to do in this area. Or it might be looking for, if I'm a, a government department and I'm trying to understand, uh, or maybe a local council looking at an area as a whole, how is the position changing in a particular area? And I can do the same thing by household composition. It shows me a particularly big difference for couples with dependent children. And I can see the big growth and how that's really compared to Greater Sydney. And you can do the same thing by household ownership, by uh, outright ownership, mortgage, private rental, public rental, and employment status as well. And so then you can do this for any uh, area that we want. So just for the argument's sake, let's go to, not to pick on them, but lots of greens if I look at an Eastern area. But again, I do want to emphasize that just because people live in say Bondi does not mean that there's not poverty there. We can see very clearly that uh, more than 10% of older people living in that area live below the poverty line. So uh, it's, again, it doesn't mean that uh, you're not living in poverty, but just means that from a concentration, it's a very different conversation. And I might look at Dorigo is a useful one. Again, then we can really see the depths of poverty in some of these areas. And you can see the color coding and immense growth of poverty for young people in this particular area. The other bit, I've got two minutes left. The other bit that the research did was it looked at the rates of low-income households. So what we wanted to do was show or look at particular communities. So Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse and people with a disability. You can't compare poverty rates with the rates of low income because the poverty rate uh, makes adjustments for uh, housing costs, uh, whereas low income is gross and it doesn't uh, account for housing costs, but it's still a very useful reference point and that is available on the second tab. It's the same kind of tool, the same system, but it allows you to see, okay, how does the low income rate compare 
for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, for example. So I can might zoom in and I can see that's the rate. So one in three uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander households in this particular SA2 live in a low income household. That's 75% higher than everyone else. It's 171% higher than the regional average. Um, and it's 45% higher than the regional average for the same type of household. So immediately again, you can see in a particular area, are there particular concentrations of economic disadvantage uh, in a particular, for a particular community? One more minute. It also allows you, we've given the raw data here. So if people wanted to pull this out and do your own analysis, this is the, the rates. It also has the change and it also gives the number because for some people and for some purposes, it can be more powerful to talk about the number of people in poverty than just the rate. And for this, it is available down below. So you can pull that out. And I'm like, if you're talking about the number of kids, to say that there are 149 kids in this area living in poverty, that is probably more powerful than saying the rate of poverty is 38%. That is me, bang on time, I think. Uh, so I will stop sharing and I will send us over to questions. I think is our discussion time. Is that right, Rosalita? Yeah. And we're, oh yes, we're gonna wrap up recording now. Um, so to those listening,